All right, so we are in a sermon series, and if it's your first time to be here today, you're at the end of a sermon series, but it's called Start With Heart. Our conviction is that everything begins with heart. Even when Jesus said the greatest commandment, love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. As the heart goes, life flows in the direction of our heart because that is the affections of our life. We've been digging in uh, five weeks now of groups. This week we'll be meeting as groups. And so if you're not in a group, um, you're welcome to jump in. There's still some groups that have some seats and uh, some here on campus, but we will be receiving uh, communion this week as a church in our groups. I think there's over 1,400, 1,500 people that are in groups. So um, I'm just, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that you've leaned in, thrilled that you're <clears throat> receiving and growing. Hearing the testimonies has been really fun and exciting. So thank you, church, for participating. I want to I want to take your attention to Romans chapter five and one. And I'll be reading two passages, Romans uh, 5 and 1, and then Galatians 4 and 6. <clears throat> I'm going to read in a second Galatians 4 and 6, and I don't want to be weird if you're kind of new to church or new to Christianity. This is not like me being weird at all. I kind of had a plan based on like my studies and my prep and my prayer time on what I was going to teach kind of each week generally. <clears throat> this week I had plans to teach, and again, I'm not trying to sound weird, on Sunday night, I had, I dreamed three times about this passage in Galatians. Three times I had a dream about it. I woke up, found it, wrote it down. I had coffee with a, a buddy of mine from this church and we were having a conversation. Monday morning, he came over to the house. We were just talking and he began to talk about his story and his testimony. And it was so intertwined with Galatians. I said, okay, this is where I believe the Lord wants us to go. So I pray in Jesus' name that it will be clear I believe it can be concise. You know, some things are easy, some things aren't easy. Um, making a charcuterie board is easy, even though some people brag about it. <laughs> Look, I made a charcuterie board. That's not hard to do. That's a big Lunchable. That's an adult <laughs> Lunchable, okay? <clears throat> You're not a master chef just yet. It's harder to spell charcuterie than it is to make a charcuterie. <laughs> but anyways, I digress. But this will, be, this will be something that we're gonna, there's a complexity to it, but hopefully um, with the help of the Holy Spirit being, uh, bring uh, a simplicity to it. So Romans chapter five and one. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have forgiveness of sins, essentially what it's saying. We have forgiveness of our past. And if you have forgiveness of your past, then you have peace, not just with God, but from God. Aren't you thankful for the peace of God that passes all understanding? How beautiful. And then it says, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. So if we have forgiveness of our past, now we have grace for our present. And then it says we rejoice in the hope. Hope is something future of the glory of God. So we forgive us for our past, grace for our present, hope for our tomorrow. And as Paul does often, he has these long run-on sentences. And we're like, how do we connect this big bodacious thought? And we'll always connect it with a conjunction, which we're going to find in just a moment. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that the sufferings produce endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does. Because... And there's that word, there's that conjunction. So what we're about to learn, all the things that we just heard are possible because of what we're about to read. So forgiveness, the grace for today, hope for the future, our ability, not only the internal world of forgiveness, the, the penalty, the power of sin, but the things that come against us, persecution, uh, the troubles of life, all that we can overcome. We are victorious. Why? Because, here it is, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Because of that, all the other things are possible. I'm gonna say it again. Because of that, everything else is possible. Let me take you to Galatians 4 and 6. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. Since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Amen? Amen. So this week is a, is a big week. Um, we have an election happening. We did a sermon series in August uh, called Contagious Culture. We talked about politics and church and religion 
And so if you want to know kind of our heart and our stand on everything, you can go back and watch it. Felt like we did a, a pretty good job of covering most bases. But I want to say this. Uh, this week, when you vote, if you haven't already voted, I want you to pray. I want you to vote. And then I want you to pray again. Amen? I want you to pray. I want you to vote. And I want you to pray again. It is a great duty and an honor that we get to vote in this republic and this democracy and be able to be a part of shaping the future. I think our involvement, our prayers are needed like never before. We need unity in our country and we need leadership in our country. We need God's spirit to move and give us direction. So we're not gonna tell you who to vote for. That's not why we're here. But I will say this, let's pray, let's vote and let's pray again, amen? Let's vote with our conscience, amen? Let's seek the Lord. We won't go wrong if we seek the Lord. Let's all seek the Lord. I'm gonna pray now. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Let your living word teach the written word. Let your word fall into good ground and bring forth much fruit. I pray for this, this family, all those online, those who are in the room. I pray, God, that you give us courage this, this week. Give us, God, I pray that there be unity this week. I pray, God, that your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know that you hold tomorrow in your hands. In Jesus' name, and everybody say, amen. amen. A gentleman went to to England on a trip, and he was visiting different churches and these beautiful old ornate churches. He would walk in and just take his breath away. How amazing. He gets to the front door of this old church in several hundred years old, and in the door is a, is a metal plaque that's in the door. It's in the wood, and it says these words, this is the gate of heaven. Enter ye all by this door. And then underneath that sign was a temporary paper sign that was taped to the door underneath it and said, this door is kept locked because of the draft. Please use the side door. How do we get there? Which way do we go? This is the question that we're all asking. Where's God taking us? The direction of our life. How do we get there? Which direction do we go? I think that's a great question. I think it's one that, if we haven't asked it out loud, our heart asks that, asks that question. Where, where is God taking us? What, what is this all about? Is there meaning to this? Is there significance to this? I heard and read this story this week about NASA's spacesuits and that the space program has been using the same spacesuits for the last 30 plus years. 30 plus years, the same suit. It used to cost... $22 million, and now it's at about $150 million to make this spacesuit. But the new spacesuit has to be better because if we're going to the moon and we're going to Mars and we're not just floating in space around the International Space Station like a, like a marshmallow, we need more mobility, we need more access, more oxygen, cleaner, you know, cleaner oxygen, the, the ability to go longer. So now the, the new spacesuit is about $250 million with a lot more design and engineering that it entails. And the point is this, is like where we've been and where we're going is different. And it's requiring new things from us and in us to be able to go there. What worked for 35 years post the lunar explorations with the Apollo, like we're no longer going to the moon, so we can just use these big bulky uh, suits. And, but no, no, we're going somewhere and it has to change. To go there, there has to be a change. And for your life and mine to go where God wants us to go, there has to be a change. There has to be a transformation. Where does it happen? How does it happen? Well, it happens when we get under God's care. God wants to do a work in our heart. And let me say this, the worst saying in, in medicine I've heard is, quote, the operation went well, but the patient died. Isn't that a terrible saying? No, the operation didn't go well because the patient died. There's a work that God is doing in your life, deep in your heart, and it's not just to do work on you, it's to make you live again. It's to call you into the great work and the exploration that God has in his kingdom. We have this saying here at the Promise Center, there is more. Say that with me, there is more. I want your heart to believe that. But how does it start? Where does it start? It starts with heart. If this isn't right, then nothing will be right. First Samuel 16 and six says this, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. He saw this man who was tall, handsome, okay? He was strong, he was, he was a CrossFit dude, kind of, kind of like me a little bit. Like, he's like, this has gotta be it. And the Lord's like, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up, hold up. And then he says, people look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at 
the heart. Don't anoint the wrong person. I'm here looking for the right heart. So what kind of heart is God looking for? We'll get to that in just a moment. Proverbs 4 and 23 tells us, above all else, guard your heart. Let me do it again. Above all else, guard your heart. There it is. For everything you do flows from it. Everything you do. In fact, in the Hebrew, it really is, what it's essentially saying is that the boundaries of your life will be determined by the condition of your heart. There are boundaries. The boundaries of your life will be determined by the condition of your heart. Did you know that everything has boundaries? When God made the fish, he gave him a boundary. You don't go beyond this point. When he made birds, he says, this is your boundary. This is as high as you go. This is as low as you go. Everything has boundaries. An airplane, 747, has a certain distance it can go. It has a certain height it can go. Elevation, everything has boundaries. Elevators have a boundary. No more than X amount of weight in this elevator, right? Everything in this world has boundaries. Your life has a metron. Your life has a boundary. And God is the one who sets that boundary. And so the condition of your heart will determine the boundaries of your life. Where does God wanna take you? Search your heart. What is God doing in your heart? He will always deal with your heart before he deals with your future. The future is easy. It's the heart of man that God is most interested in. So the greatest limitations are not on the outside of you. The greatest limitations in your life are inside of you. And so you are the sole custodian of your heart. Guard your heart. People can hurt you. They can take advantage of you, but only you can ruin your life. Only you can ruin your life. You are the sole custodian of your heart. Psalms 139 and one says this, O Lord, you've examined my heart and know everything about me. So we choose to live a life that is examined because an unexamined life is a dangerous life. Your outside life is your reputation with people, but your inside life is your reputation with God. It's how you are known in heaven. And can I say, you can be a success on earth and a failure in heaven. You can have all the right things going. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can never fool God. God knows what's really in us. So we fail internally before we fail externally. We win internally before we win externally. And we have car alarms, house alarms. We have phone cases and passwords to guard our stuff. But who is guarding our heart? That's the question of the day. That's the question of the sermon series. Who is ordering our private world? Are you in charge? Is somebody else in charge? Guard and protect your heart. Why? Because all the issues are there. The issues, it's the command center of your life. Your heart is the seat of your faith. Mark chapter 11 and 22 says, have faith in God. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their their heart. So where is the seat of faith? It's in the heart. It's not the knowing in the natural mind. It's the knowing in the heart. He says, it will happen and be done for them. But you know what else resides in the heart? Luke chapter 29, excuse me, verses uh, chapter 12 and 29 says this, Do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. That worry also comes from the heart. It's our inability to trust God. He says, trust, trust God. I want you to trust. Where does trust come from? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. Sometimes it doesn't, we don't understand it. We gotta lean and go, God, I'm gonna trust you in my heart. And I'm gonna pray until I build up my most holy faith, building my heart up, trusting you. Because we wanna walk in this world in faith, not worry. We wanna walk in this world, overcomers. And it all starts with heart. Gotta go back to the heart. Angola Prison in Louisiana, the Louisiana State Penitentiary. It was the number, it was the worst penitentiary literally in all of America. When you went in, literally they said there, were bl- there was blood all over the walls and the ceiling. They kept washing it, blood kept, there's blood everywhere, fights, gang breakouts. It was just, it was the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst. In fact, when, when people were being admitted into the prison, they literally would give them a knife and say, good luck, protect yourself. They would hand them a knife. 6,000 prisoners, 85% of them have no parole. Until a man, a warden by the name of Burl Kane shows up. He says, we're not going to win this at the psychological level. We're not going to win this at the behavioral level. We're going to win this battle at the heart level. So they started playing Christian music down the hallways, kind of have a captive audience, no pun intended. (laughs) Put a Bible in, in every room, made each of them go to chapel every day. They had people sharing their testimony at lunchtime. 
They inundated them with the word of God and with the hope of God. And they said they begin to see it to break. Something began to break in their hearts before it broke out in the prison. And one by one, they became followers of Jesus. And one by one, their whole disposition changed until Angola prison became one of the safest prisons in America. Gangs turn into gangs of preachers. Amen. God does a deep work and it always starts with heart. Why is this important? Because where God is taking us, where God is taking us requires us to have the right heart. You know, I talk to people all the time. I'm a pastor. So people come to me like, hey, I'm going through this thing. And they'll just start to describe the thing they're going through. And they're like, but it's just, it's just a season, pastor. This too will pass. And they start describing it to me. I'm like, bro, this is not a season. This is a cycle in your life. Because a season comes and goes with time. But a cycle doesn't change until you change. There were people who were marching around the same mountain over and over for 40 years. They couldn't progress because their heart wouldn't change. And what you've called a cycle, it's just a cycle, it's just a bad cycle, it's just a bad cycle of, uh, excuse me, a, ba- a bad season of like, like mishaps and relationship failment. What, what if it's more than just a season? What if you're in a cycle, you're stuck in a cycle, and the only thing that will change the cycle, we move into and through seasons by time, but we move through cycles with change. It requires change. Now, we're in a seasonal change right now. My wife put up uh, the decorations yesterday. November 1st is like her day when the Halloween like thing is over, and she's like November 1st all the way to December 26, like that's it's like, she's hardcore. She's like old school, hardcore, legalistic about it. We are doing this and we're going to enjoy Christmas together for two months. <laughs> and we're like, yeah, Rudolph the red nosed reindeer, pumpkin spice, you know, all the smells. And it's a season, like the season's changing. But how do we detect a change that God's trying to get us out of a cycle? You look at the leaves, what do you look? No, you look at your heart. Because you can detect what God wants to do in you and through you by what he is doing inside your heart. Do you feel it? Do you sense it? Do you sense the change? Do you feel the stirring? I hope you do. I've heard stories and I believe that God, his best is yet to come. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to share with you in this last installment, six weeks of Start With Heart, I'm gonna share with you the best and the worst kind of heart. And I think the best kind of heart, you're probably not gonna guess. But I'm gonna share with you the best and the worst. It's like, okay, we have the best taco and the worst taco. My brother-in-laws can attest to this, that I am one of those people who like, I love numbers and charts. And like, is this like, what's your top five favorite movies? What's your top five favorite burrito? What's your top five favorite taco? What's your top five favorite hamburger? And I think it kind of maybe dies from nuts because I, I, I like, like, or I like, okay, what's the, and I do this all the time. I do it with Heidi the other day. She made chili and she's like, how was it? And I said, it's a 99.99999. Wasn't good enough. She wanted a hundred. I was like, if it's a hundred, then the rest of your chili will never live up to it. You just get better every time. I got to leave a little wiggle room. Anyways, we're still working through that. Thank God for hearts that are adaptable. Anyways, so like, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna share with you the worst and the best. I'm gonna share with you like a Taco Bell taco and La Taqueria on Mission Street in San Francisco taco. Come on, somebody. Finger licking good. So here we go. I'm gonna share with you the worst kind of heart that you can have. The worst kind of heart. Proverbs chapter 16 and five says this. The Lord detests all the proud of heart. Like, don't have a proud heart. God detests a proud heart. Why does he detest a proud heart? Pride is what turned an angel into a devil. Pride destroys people. It turns people into animals. It turns marriages into UFC fights. It turns relationships into deserts. It changes people. Pride is the great destroyer of lives. Timothy Keller said this, pride is the carbon monoxide of sin. It slowly kills you without you even knowing. And here's the deal, pride likes to hide and you think you don't have it. And I say, well, I don't have it. I know some proud people, but it lurks inside of each and every one of us. In every one of our hearts, there's a bent toward me, 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 me. No one fights like Gaston. No one's cool like Gaston. All of our hearts sing that song. Every one of us have pride lurking inside of us. This is something you are gonna have to crucify 
daily. Jonathan Edwards said this, the heart of man is full of pride, full of selfishness, full of enmity against God. Sin has spoiled everything in the human soul. That's why James four and six says, but he gives more grace. Come on, bring the grace, God. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves to God. Bow that knee. The Bible says that pride comes before a fall. So the humble will not stumble. If you stay humble, you're not gonna stumble. It's the moment that you get that big head. It's the moment that you think, I got this. It's the moment you think, I can do this without God. I don't need him. I got this, baby. The moment you say that you're good, you're, it's good, you're, gonna, you're gonna be a trip. You're gonna be tripping. Is that right? Do the kids still say that? I don't know. <laughs> tripping, you're tripping. I don't know. Verse Peter five and six says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humility is the life blood and power of Christ and pride is the barrier to every single blessing, a proud heart. Now, Satan, we talk about Satan. He's this, who was an archangel that stood in the presence of God. His name was Lucifer. And he would be in the presence of God and the light of God would shine through Lucifer and a light show would happen in the heavens. But he had an eye problem. Not E-I, sorry, E-Y-E, was an eye problem. I, I will ascend. I will be like the most high. I will go to the heavens. I will be. And when he started to puff himself up with pride, he fell low. And that's why he says, he says, give more grace. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourself to God. And then if we humble ourselves before the Lord, he will exalt you. First Peter five and six. So humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God or the mighty power of God. At the right time, he will lift you up. Whenever you humble yourself, God will lift you up. If you, if you dig dip deeper than just the, the thing that you're dealing with, lying, adultery, murder, hate, uh, racism, gossip, fornication, thievery, slander, all that stuff, you go, you burrow deeper, you'll find there's a reason, there's an effect of that. Why is that? Well, there's envy, bitterness, jealousy, fear, greed, wickedness, wicked imaginations, all that. But under that, that is coming from one thing, pride. Pride and arrogance destroys. So we cannot clean our heart unless we bow our knee. And when you humble your life, I'm telling you, it'll change everything. So the worst kind of heart you can have is a proud heart. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, it leads us to believe that if the worst heart is a proud heart, then the best heart is a humble heart. So close, but not quite. I'm gonna share with you the greatest kind of heart that you can have. The greatest kind of heart that you can have. Genesis 2 and 25 says this. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. What we find in the book of Genesis, especially at the beginning, we see divine order, how things are supposed to be. Now, when you say, hey, kids, read your Bible, be careful. There's a lot of stuff like this in here. So just know that right at the beginning. But is it, what's the point of this? Like Adam and Eve, they were both walking around naked and felt no shame. There's gotta be more to it than just like a picture of like, oh yeah, it was just like free. It was like, peace, man, this is great. You know, we have one of those in Mendocino, I think. You know, that, this is not the point. I think the point is much deeper. There's a spiritual relevance that we have to pay attention to. And here's what it is. It's very simple. They were fully known and they were fully loved. No hiding, no shadows, no disguise, no pretend fully known, fully loved. That is the target. That's what we're going after today. Now, let me share with you a couple things and why this is important. There's this word yada, yada. And again, I'm gonna do a little teaching here for just a moment, and then we'll get to our final point. Genesis chapter four and one. Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife. That word knew is yada. It's a word like an intimate word. I know this person or thing intimately. It's not a word where you go, hey, I know, I know 
Michael Jordan. You don't know Michael Jordan. Well, I know about Michael Jordan. It's not that kind. There's a lot of other Hebrew words and Greek words for knowing about something. But this word is a very intimate word. I know intimately this person. So watch this. He, Adam knew, Yada, Eve, his wife, intimately knew. Genesis 3 and 7 says this. After they sinned, then the eyes of both were open and they, yada, intimately knew they were naked. They knew and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths or aprons. Hear me out. What did they know in that moment? When sin entered into their life, immediately, not a knowing up here, not the data points, not the metrics, but now there was a spiritual awareness, a knowing, a yada of sin, which brings shame, which brings guilt, which brings fear. So hear me. Your heart is like a black box. It records everything. There's a black box on every airplane that every move that the plane makes, it records. Every conversation, it records. And so if there's a crash, what will be saved is the black box. They retrieve the black box. They can know exactly what went wrong. It's all recorded there. And unfortunately, everything you've ever done, even if you forget it, it's recorded in your heart. What do you do with a heart that is full of shame and guilt and fear? What do you do with that kind of heart? Some of you walked into this room and you've been trying to manage this area of your life. In fact, I'm gonna say this statement. I want you to hear me very carefully. I want you to listen and lean in. You were not built for guilt. There's nowhere in the apparatus of your being where God said, hey, by the way, I'm gonna make man so he has this little place to put guilt. So what we end up doing is we record it on our conscience and then we either project it or we keep stuffing it and burying it. Some of you look like, you, man, these people don't project any pain and sorrow. They're just so good. But what you didn't realize is they were just cramming it deeper into their soul, into their heart, and they've been trying to manage guilt and shame. Guilt and shame is the result of sin. But the problem with guilt and shame, it takes away the confident heart toward God. And when, what God wants to give you is the kind of heart that is full of his spirit, the one that says, Abba, Father. Yes. The one that knows God is good, scheming to bless you. The heart that has an assurance that says, God is fighting for you and you are his child. You are not a slave, you are a son. It was Carl Menninger, the famed uh, psych, psych, uh, psychiatrist that said that if he could convince patients in psychiatry, uh, psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, he said 75% of them would walk out that very day. He said, our world is plagued with carrying shame and guilt and fear. And because of it, we are cast down and broken. I want you to see this word. One more word, gnosko. It's the New Testament version in the Greek of the Hebrew word yada in the Old Testament. So watch this. He, uh, Luke chapter one and 34 says this. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I don't gnosko a man? Gnosko, a man. Matthew 13, 11 says this. That's intimately known. Matthew 13, 11 said this. And he answered them, to you it has been given to gnosko, the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. This is not an earthly, this is not a mind kind of knowing. This is a spiritual knowing. Just like when Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, you're, you're, you're Jesus, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, you did not get this from flesh and blood. This is not from your biology. This is not knowing from data points. This came, this knowing came from your father in heaven. This is a different kind of knowing. And this is the knowing we're talking about. When you know that you know, even when your brain is not computing, but your heart goes, I know it. I know it. I can't understand it yet. I can't explain it yet, but I know. Here's another gnosko, that intimate knowing. Ephesians 3 and 16. I pray that 
out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your... All right, 11 o'clock, okay. (laughs) That Christ may dwell in your... Through faith, and I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, watch this, together with the Lord's holy people to grasp, watch the four dimensions, how wide, long, high, and deep is the love of Christ, and to, here it is, gnosko, his love that surpasses just basic earthly knowledge. There is going to be an understanding here, but not an understanding here. The love of God surpasses your ability to articulate, he loves me. But in Galatians, the scripture that I shared with you earlier, it says that when the spirit enters and fills our heart, our heart goes, Abba, Dad. Our heart has this assurance that goes, I know that I know that I know that I'm loved. What is the alternative? to know your sin, to know your shame, to know what you did, to calculate everything based on sin, shame, fear, doubt, or to be full of the Spirit and to walk like Jesus walked. How did Jesus walk? I'll tell you how he walked. The Bible says that he was baptized. And when the Spirit descended upon him, a voice opened from heaven and said what? This is my beloved Son in whom I'm what? Well pleased. Beloved means affection. I have affection for him. Son means acceptance. He belongs to me. Pleased means affirmation. Affection, acceptance, and affirmation. Not based on what Jesus did, but based on who he was. So Jesus didn't go out doing ministry, because that was the beginning of his ministry. He didn't go out doing ministry for acceptance, for affirmation, he went out and did ministry from acceptance and from affirmation. My point is this, is when you have a heart that is full of the knowledge of God going, I'm loved, I'm his, I belong to him, you can do anything in his name. You can walk in power. And so many Christians are weak because the knowledge that we carry around in us is the knowledge of our past and the knowledge of our failures. And this is the thing that is prim is prevalent in our spirit. And what God wants to do is fill you with the spirit and let you have that full assurance in your heart. I had a a friend who went to seminary, a class of a hundred people getting the MDiv. Toward the end of this class, a professor asked, how many of you here, if you died today, you know without a shadow of a doubt you would be with Jesus in heaven. Five out of a hundred people raised their hands. In the last service, we had our dear friend, Mike Matea, who pastors in, uh, in, in Bale, Uganda. We've gone to see him several times. We've sent teams over there. He was just in this service. He's a great man. His family was here. He didn't grow up a Christian. He grew up a Muslim. And one of the things that he said was, he told me, he said, Muslims just don't know. You don't know if God's angry or happy with you. You don't know that when you die, if you did enough, you'll never, ever, ever know. And I, I suspect there's people in this room, maybe you grew up like me in more of a religious bent toward Christianity, where everything is about, did you do enough? Did you try enough? Do you have enough? Did you check all the boxes? And there's not assurance. You, it's all about, so what you're thinking about, did I do it right? And so who gets the praise that I did it right, I said it right, I acted right? Who gets the praise? All praise to Chadwick. You made it to heaven. Great job. No, when we get to heaven, there's only one who will get all the praise and get all the honor and get all. He's going to get all the credit. We're here because of you. (laughs) We did nothing. The, the 24 elders dressed in white, the most righteous that the world could ever offer, the most perfect, the best people on the planet before the throne. When Jesus, the lamb came out from the throne, they all fell on their face because it paled in comparison to the perfectness, the righteousness, the holiness of our living Lord. You have to have that insurance, not based on what you've done, but what has been done for you. 
So Hebrews chapter 10 and 22, let us draw near with a true heart. In what? Thank you, second row. I know you got an extra hour of sleep and it's tough today. Let us draw near with a true heart. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. There it is. Let's not start a choir. We will not, we will not work. It won't work. Okay. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, God's work is to cleanse your heart so you can have full assurance. I love this, 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 this verse, 1 John chapter 4 and 18. Watch this, watch this. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. I'm telling you, when your heart gets full of his love, cast out fear. It's confidence. So, so what's the opposite of a, of a perfectly bad heart? Pride. It's not a humble heart. It's a confident heart in God. Amen. Romans chapter eight, he poured his spirit upon our hearts, uh, upon us, and now we cry, Abba, Father, over and over, Abba, Father. We've been adopted, Abba, Father. One of my favorite verses is the one that says, Jesus said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you and give you my spirit and be with you forever. Now, being an orphan back in the days of Jesus, very different than being an orphan today. And being an orphan in the days of Jesus generally meant you had no place to go, no rights, no authority, no inheritance, no name, very different. And so there's this theological term called an orphan spirit. And what Jesus is saying is, I don't want you to be someone who doesn't have an identity, doesn't have security, doesn't have confidence. I want you to be someone who your heart cries, Abba, I'm loved, I'm beloved, I'm accepted, I'm in, I'm part of the family, I'm an heir. So I love this passage right here. First John 3 and 19. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. For our hearts condemn us, for if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. So let me tell you this, even if your heart today condemns you and you're carrying it and you're wrestling it, can I tell you that God is greater than your heart? God is greater than your heart. We know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Fully known, fully loved. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. You know the kind of heart you gotta walk with is a heart that is full of the assurance of God. Let me tell you a quick story. There, there was a, a young lady, Fanny Crosby, who wrote some of the most amazing music it came out of a life of, of pain. When she was one years old, she was born 200 years ago. When she was born, she got very sick and a doctor, the, the, the town doctor wasn't available. So they called a person that claimed to be a doctor. He put mustard on a rag and put it on her eyes because the infection of her, the, her, this flu got in her eyes. And so he put literally mustard on her eyes and she became blind. A few years later, her father died. So her and her mother were in this very, crazy, peculiar situation. And they just leaned on the Lord, leaned on the Lord. She pressed in and Fanny Crosby began to hear and memorize chapter after chapter of the Bible. She memorized all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and several other books of the Bible. And she began to write. And one of her most famous songs that she wrote was this, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory 
divine. Heir of salvation, purchased of God, born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Blessed assurance. Then it says this. This is the next verse. Perfect submission. Perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Hear me now. It's blessed assurance. There's no greater gift that you can have as a follower of Jesus than to yada, to gnosko, to know that you know that you know you are his child. And out of your heart, yada, Abba, 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 Father. Because when you know you're his, you can go through anything. You can walk through anything. You can persevere your past, present, your future. And in Romans chapter eight, it says this. It says that we now cry, Abba, Father. And then it goes on to say this. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Height, nor death, nor any other creature can be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Blessed assurance. And the last, the last stanza says this. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Blessed assurance. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. I grew up not knowing if I was loved. The greatest sign of the Holy Spirit is not the fruit, the gifts. It is knowing, Abba, I am loved by God. It's knowing. It's knowing. It's knowing. It's knowing. I am not a slave. I am a child of God. I want to close with a quick story. If you're here today and you say, man, Pastor Chad, I want that assurance. I've been doing Christianity. I've been, but I, I want to be filled with the, the love, the love of God. I want my guilt, my shame, my, my fear, my pain. I want it. I don't want that to be the, the guiding factor of my life. I want to be full of the assurance of God. Would you stand, whoever you are? I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I'm going to pray for those who are ready to walk with confidence. 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 Let me tell you one of my favorite stories. Thomas Edison, one of the greatest minds in, in the history of this country. This was in his biography. As many of you know, Thomas Edison, the incandescent light bulb, phonograph film, movie camera, carbon microphone, uh, electric power distribution, and so many other inventions that this brilliant person invented. When he was just a kid, and he was born in 1847, but when he was just a kid, he went to school and one day he comes back from school and he gave his mom a note and said, mom, they gave me this note to give to you. And she read it and she could see that he was moved. She was moved and he didn't know what it said. He goes, mom, what, what does it say? And she said, 
it says that your son's a genius and this t- school is too small for him and doesn't have good enough teachers to train him. So please train him yourself. And so for the next seven years, she trained him and taught him in school and he becomes a great inventor. And one day she dies and he's going through her stuff. He finds the letter. He pulls the letter out and this is what the letter said. Your son is mentally deficient. We cannot let him attend our school anymore. He is expelled. But love, love sees different. And I don't know what's been written on your heart or written over your head or written over your life. Can I tell you, love always wins. Wins.